I stand here as somebody who really wanted something um, but gave up on it and only by an unusual and surprising set of circumstances came to get a second shot at it. Um, and I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to get what you want and do the things that you're here to do. Um, so I want to tell you the story of the last couple of years and then I'll give you my takeaways from it in hopes that they might help. But first let me go way back and say that if you were to read my journals from middle school and high school, you would see that I wanted to be skinnier. I wanted guest jeans and a Walkman too. And I wanted to be a writer. And in many ways, I already was. I wrote every day in diaries that I still have, and they're carefully hidden and locked away. I was the kid who sent home 12 page letters from Camp Takwa detailing the swim test and the Suyu dance and the bug juice and a certain water skier named Andy Bloom. I was an English major in college and even submitted some truly nauseating poetry to our little creative writing magazine on campus. And in my 20s, I was a nanny for a woman who had a, this for a family where the mother had died and she left behind a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, a second husband, three kids from her first marriage and her 80-year-old father from Fiji. And I tried to write the story of what it was like to live there. Um, and, you know, at the time I was just a girl who wanted to go to Australia and make out with Australian boys. Um, I didn't really sign up for a life-altering experience. But I stopped eventually because I couldn't convince myself that there was any agent anywhere that would read it. Um, and it just seemed like if I was destined to be a writer, I would have been one already. I would have you know, been in some creative writing program, I would have gone to a better college. Um, and so I gave up on the idea of writing as a profession and I just kept doing my journals. But then at 36, I had two kids in diapers and I got a phone call that I had a runaway case of stage three breast cancer and I'd be in chemotherapy in a week. Um, and if that wasn't enough, uh, shortly after my father, who had been taking such good care of me, um, got a similar phone call that he had a case of stage three bladder cancer and would be in chemotherapy in a week. And he, um, he was very sick. It was the second time he had had cancer um, and I was very scared and I had um, suddenly the motivation that I had always needed to write something complete and whole um, and do the sustained work that all good endeavor requires. Um, and my goal was just to tell him once and for all what it was to be his kid. Um, so I wrote. And then my sister-in-law, Phoebe, got a hold of it. And Phoebe is a believer. Phoebe is one of those people where nothing's crazy. No idea you have is too big or too nutty for Phoebe to swallow. Her favorite line is, why not you? Um, so Phoebe finding the writing and, and taking it in was sort of my second stroke of good fortune. Um, and she really helped me take the whole thing seriously in a way that I never could have without her. Um, eventually the work was picked up by an agent, oh so sorry, it was picked up by an agent and it sold in four days. There were three publishers fighting over it. It came out a year and a half later and it sat on the bestseller list for six months. And here I am bragging to you. But there's a reason. No, no, don't, don't do that. I'm only telling you this so that I can get to the part where I give you my takeaways, which are these. The first takeaway is something that Dr. Jameson said, which is that you have to admit that you want something. And that can be really awkward. I think that sometimes women feel sheepish about having ambition. Um, it's been a little bit of a dirty word for us. I think it makes us think, you know, who do you think you are? And why do you want more than what you have? And what's wrong with what you have? Um, so I think it can be alienating, um, and I think it can be kind of unsettling, you know, to the status quo. Um, but you do have to confess that there is something that you think you can do. I think sometimes we keep our ideas to ourselves or sort of reduce them to something more acceptable, you know? We bake brownies instead of building furniture or designing a home. But I feel like we're all secretly aware that there are things that we'd like to try and might actually be able to do if we weren't so embarrassed to be seen trying. 
Sometimes when I'm holding back, um, shrugging my shoulders and playing dumb and leaving the world to smarter people or more qualified people, I hear my mother in my head saying what she said to me a thousand times growing up, which was, oh, honey, who's looking at you? <laughs> the, the next line was something like, if you want to wear leg warmers, wear leg warmers. But, but that self-consciousness that kicks in around kindergarten and holds us hostage until we're finally old enough to wear red, wear purple with a red hat, as the famous poem reads, impacts more than just our fashion choices. It not only tells us we can't, but it gets specific. It tells us exactly why we can't. Which brings me to my second takeaway, which is also something that Dr. Jameson put out there, which is to recognize your own prejudices about who's allowed to do what, and then open your eyes to the reality. So I really had this sense that I wasn't a writer in my DNA. I was too ordinary. I was too average a student. I went to a regular school. I only got a thousand on my SATs, um, and I let those things kind of define me in the sense that uh, I just didn't have a right to try. Um, I just wonder what maybe some of your hesitations or prejudices are that a black woman or a gay woman or a woman your age shouldn't really be going after whatever it is that you're trying to go after. My favorite story of somebody going for it is my old neighbor Jane who uh, placed an ad in the New York Review of Books that said, I'm 67 and I'm looking to have a lot of sex with a man I like. <laughs> so it's not just professional things that we want. And she and her boyfriend just celebrated her 70th birthday, probably having sex. The third thing is uh, find the right carrot. So my carrot was this vision of handing my father the story of my childhood. And this, this vision came to me right around the same time that self-publishing became an option, like this affordable way to get something bound. And I swear to God that when I was in my little room writing, that was the thing, I, the picture I had in my head was going to Wooded Lane where I was raised in Philadelphia, by the way, go Phillies. Even though I live in San Francisco now, sorry. Um, I had this vision of handing him this bound thing and like once and for all being able to say, you know, you're, you're the cornerstone of everything for me. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. And so whatever your carrot is, you need one. And it will help you to sort of forget the world of reason and probability and how long the odds actually are um, and forget the world that, is, wor world that is mouthing the words you are most afraid to hear. Who do you think you are? Which brings me to number four. Be careful who you tell. Early stage investors are rare. Not everyone has an imagination fluid enough to take in your idea. Many people will look crosswise at your vision until you have proof, which they often refer to as traction. These are dangerous people and should be avoided. One raised eyebrow in the fragile beginning stages of anything can cast a shadow over the whole crop and nothing grows without sunshine. So find your Phoebe. And in the same, on the same note, you have to be somebody's Phoebe. You have to pay it forward because it's self-reinforcing. You learn what you teach. My fifth takeaway is sort of tactical, which is I really believe it's important once you have a big project or a company or a book or a screenplay or a marathon or a relationship that you're trying to fix, that you break it down into smaller tasks and do something small every day. Make one phone call, look up one statistic, buy a pack of highlighters, watch a TED lecture, fix your printer, write a page, squeeze it into the nooks and crannies of your life. Do it regularly until it becomes a habit. And I think there's two reasons. The first is obvious, which is little steps, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. The second is less obvious, but I really feel sure of this. I think that, you know, we don't use very much of our brains percentage-wise. I think that our subconscious is this great tool that we're not um, using enough. And so for me, even when I'm struggling to write something, I try to interact with it every day 
usually at the end of the day as well as during the day, so that when I go to sleep, I can sort of trigger that subconscious. And then when I wake up, I have those 20 minutes before maybe my feet hit the ground where I can just sit there and think quiet thoughts before there is email, before there are telephones, before there are little children needing to be fed and forced to brush their teeth. Um, so use your subconscious. The sixth thing is you have to be very, very comfortable with failure. And I have a way that I do that. Um, for the most part, I'm on pretty good terms with failure. I failed a lot when I was young, which I think is a gift. I was cut from many a field hockey team. I lost the election for class secretary. I made homemade sundresses that were sort of a flop. So I know that what I can imagine with such clarity often falls apart in the execution. But I also know that it doesn't usually matter a whole lot. Not to say that the old fears never creep up on me. Will the studio exec check his cell phone while I'm pitching my movie idea? Will I fall off the chairlift in Tahoe? Will no one show for my ladies' night? But I have learned to talk back to the fears, and I always say the same thing. Seven billion people. There are seven billion people alive right now. So given that scope of things, I am nobody. And that may seem depressing or counterintuitive to some of you, but for me, anonymity is totally liberating. If I have to really work myself out of some anxiety, sometimes I even do a little exercise that helps me to visualize the seven billion people. I cl this sounds so tutti fruity. Maybe it's been living in California too long, but it works. I close my eyes and fly around the country, lifting the roofs off of various houses and peeking in. In this house, someone just announced their engagement. In this one, a man packs his army gear for Afghanistan. In the next house, a woman goes into labor. A man tells his wife he lost his job. Long days, perfect days, days packed with danger or commotion or solitude or heartache. Then I leave the country. I go to Nepal or Mexico or Africa, and I lift their roofs and open their kitchen cabinets and try on their homemade shoes and pat their shabby pillows. Seven billion people. A nurse hangs malaria nets. A boy makes a fire on the kitchen floor. A mom combs her daughter's hair. Seven billion people. The more I fly, the smaller I get until I'm just about the right size, the size of one person among billions, working my way through my tiny life as best I can. Beyond failure, there is laziness and procrastination and the why bother question. Here's why. Because important things need doing. The pol there are policies that are messed up and schools that are on respirators and nonprofit funding is at an all-time low. Because other people can't. They have no time or they have poor health or they have no access. My neighbor is very sick and maybe dying, and I think about her every time I make a choice about my day, and I feel like I owe it to her and all those people and to my future self, who will someday not be healthy, to make hay while my sun is shining. Because our kids are watching. We're growing the next generation, and it's our job to grow them well. Because together we are an army. And it is women who demand that things change and then sort out ways to change them. And lastly, because, quite frankly, it's hard to find ways to get high at our age. Although apparently it's going to get easier. And you'll be a lot happier when you find the right role for yourself in the world. Beach days, TV, remodeling kitchens, this is all peripheral stuff. Essential, but peripheral. Good work, good, hard, meaningful work is at the core. And every day we have to decide how big the center will be and how small the edges will be. Good work redeems. It repairs and enlarges and ties us all together. It makes us feel lucky to be here, doing the things we are meant to do. Thank you so much.